There's something eminently sexy about being well read, by having a mind that's capable of nuanced thought, that's capable of appreciating beauty, that's capable of understanding great literature, great art, great music, and discussing it. And not only is that the case, and I believe that's the case, but I also believe that through understanding, appreciating, reading, sharing, enjoying great literature, that we can change the world because we're ultimately changing ourselves and bettering ourselves. Harold Bloom, one of the late great uh, critics of the 20th century, he said that you should never try to change your neighbour when you read, but I think that's actually false because I think when you read, you have the power to, if you read imaginative literature, for example, to, and if you read poetry, you can assume somebody else's skin, you can get into their soul, you can see through the eyes of somebody else, you can develop empathy, and you can live a thousand lifetimes in one of all disparate uh, ages and proclivities and creeds and colours. You can live these lives and you can take it on and you can uh, become composite of many different lives. That's just one benefit, but also through reading, and I'm, again, I'm not just talking about literature, but I'm talking about non-fiction as well. Not that you shouldn't read fiction as though it were non-fiction, because I believe you should, but if you read non-fiction, history, philosophy, you can see where history repeats itself. You can, you might read something that was written 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 50 years ago, and you can understand what's happening today, what happened yesterday, what, what's going to happen tomorrow. And sometimes you can seem like a prophet, like a prophetic. You can have visions of the future, and people won't believe you, they'll call you crazy, they'll call you insane, they'll say, no, that's not true, you're incorrect, you're mad. And then it will happen. And you'll go, do you believe what I say now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They'll make your concessions, and then you'll do it again and they won't believe you again. And why can you predict the future? Every single time, it's because you've read it, you've seen it in history, look backwards to look forward. You can change the world. Every, of course, you always, if you want to change this world, you start with yourself. And the best way to start with yourself is to start understanding the great books, enjoying them. Of course, we can talk about how art for art's sake and is, is valued, and that's very, very fair. But I do think there's, it's something, there's nothing wrong with being selfish. And so if one were to say that reading and appreciating great art and deriving great enjoyment from it, and I tell you what, it is, it is an enjoyment that people don't, even understand these days. But if that was selfish, my contention is, so what? Okay, I'm selfish. Is that the worst thing in the world? But it's not. I think it's actually selfless. And I think being selfish is actually, and it sounds like a contradiction, but you know, that's the, that's the, that's the difficult thing about life is that we've got to get used to and comfortable with contradictions because two things can be uh, true at the same time. Sometimes things are not even true. They're not even false. It's just you know, whether the thought is helpful or harmful to you. In literature lies vision, and in literature lies light and guidance that can release us from shackles, self-imposed shackles, where we're victims. Literature empowers, and it gives us a great load of joy, and in being selfish and selfishly appreciating it, we become selfless. We need more people today reading literature together, not solitary. That's another thing I disagree with people. Reading, whilst it is a lovely solitary pleasure, and there is a lot of real pleasure to be gained from going into solitude and considering what you're reading, I think the best literature is shared. You want to share it. You share wine with your friends. You share good, good food with your friends. You go to the cinema. Yes, many people go and see a film on their own, or they'll listen to music on their own. But how much more beautiful when you whack on a record and then you've got people around you and you're like, isn't that great? And you all share. And then someone says, what about this bit? And you go, oh yeah, I didn't even know that bit. Same with a movie. It's the same with books. And there's no decent book clubs in this world anymore. They're all froth. They're all uh, picking books that just, I, again, I don't want to be a snob because some of my favorite books are certainly not avant-garde. They're not ho art. They're not Nobel Prize winners. But we need more conscious reading. And whether that means we read the great books like Homer, we read Shakespeare, or whether we read things that would be designated pulp, as long as we're being more conscious and uh, awake and alive, uh, alive to the tune and the rhythms of life, and see that this thing that we're holding in our hands is precious because it's the soul of another human being. It's not just uh, dead trees, okay? It's the soul of another human being, and it's what connects us all. And when we read these great books, People are writing their era, whether they know it or not, whether the story has anything to do with what's going on historically. They're writing their era and they're communicating across time with, tra with time traveling. But obviously it's something that keeps me up late at night, something that makes me toss and turn, something that actually causes me a lot of trauma is the fact that I keep asking myself, do people actually even give a shit about poetry anymore? Do people give a shit about great books? Do people give a shit about discussing it? Do people actually want to listen to poetry? I don't know. I do. I know that when I was uh, doing my GCSEs, which is uh, in England, that's the um, secondary school, high school exams, when I was doing my exams, 
Oh, I would have loved to have someone or a collection of somebodies talking passionately and fervently about great literature. Like, we'd sit down and we just, we, maybe we'd pick up a volume of Rumi's poetry and then we're all over the map and we're talking about this and that and we're talking about Nietzsche and the Bible and Buddha. We're talking about black and white, right and wrong, good and evil, man and woman, child and adult. We're talking about all these things and we're all doing it lovingly. We're opening up a dialogue and we're getting to know each other. And we just, I'd never had that where, right when I wanted it. When I used to stay up and devour poetry, I did try and search for it. I tried to find somebody who would read the poem aloud in the rhythms that, them, that it's meant to be read. Like, but I could only find people doing book readings, save for a very few occasions, where it just seemed like whoever was on the other end was d reading as an obligation. It was like they were trying to make it boring. There was no life, there was no blood, there was no pulse or beat of a heart. And there still isn't today. And so I thought, well, hey, I, this is what I want to see in the world. And okay, it's a bit of a leap. Maybe I, my passion projects are not somebody else's passion projects. I've got passion projects where I'm like, well, there's a great volume of poetry called Men and Women by Robert Browning, 1855. And it was largely ignored in his lifetime, largely ignored now, to be honest, but it's one of my favorite volumes of poetry. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if all 50 plus, I think it's 51, 52 poems in that volume, if someone just beautifully read each of them aloud. And then you've just got this thing where it's, you hear the lilt and musicality the way Browning wanted. And then maybe we do Keats. And then maybe, maybe we bring Shakespeare alive. Maybe I sit down and like, just now I sat down and I read uh, two chapters of Great Expectations. I love Great Expectations. One of my favourite books. One of my f best memories in my life was my teacher passionately reading Great Expectations. And I thought, wow, if we could just scale this classroom experience and give that reading, whew, people would fall in love with Dickens. It would be so good. Uh, so I sat down and I thought, well, do you know what would be really cool? Dickens wrote Great Expectations in a serialised fashion. You don't binge it, okay? You, you, one week, two chapters. Next week, another two chapters. The week after that, one chapter, then two. There was a, there was a bit of a, a rhythm to it, and it was a different style of reading. It's the same with Henry James, Turn of the Screw, countless others. And so I thought, wouldn't it be great if, because uh, people would, they'd get Great Expectations, and they'd read it out to their family, and they'd sit around a crackling fire, and they'd read out the next instalment. And then they'd have to wait for the next instalment. We'd have to wait. This is a, this is we've lost the art of patience, and patience actually is a unique sort of pleasure. Now it's just binge this, binge that, and everything's indispensable. Everything's froth and meaningless. You can just whack on a song on Spotify. Oh, I don't like it. Turn it off halfway through. It's not like a vinyl record where you've got the record, you put it down, and then it hit the end of the record, and you've got to flip it over. You cherish that record, and you listen to it a thousand times over. Right, when you've got, like, ebooks are great, I love them. I've got a thousand books on, on, my, on my Kindle, um, but pe there's nothing beats paper. We're holding it in hand, showing other people, writing on it, and just like, this object where it contains so much possibility. We, I think, we're all kind of miserable right now, and I think social media is whipping us up into a frenzy over things that don't actually even exist or don't even matter. And if they do matter and they do exist, then people are dealing with them in the incorrect way. They're dealing with them uh, from a sense of hate instead of love. And I think whilst we, there is a time and a place for the things, the narratives that the media want us to talk about and that the politicians want us to talk about, there's also a time and a place, um, and this has been neglected for great literature, great art, great appreciation, and just getting some life back into us. And I think the great books literature, talking about it, coming together, sharing it, uh, sharing a passion. I think that is the avenue to that. And I think we all deserve it. And we all deserve a little bit of self-love. I think we should all sit down and we should all read a damn good story and then have a chat about it. Like, why not? Why is that not happening? Why is it just binge this immaterial thing, binge this frivolous thing, and then get angry about whatever's happening on social media? I'm sorry. Forget all that noise. We need, this is why I want to do hardcore literature. This is why I'm passionate about it. And, and you know what? I've reconciled the fact that many people won't give a damn. Many people will be like, nah, boring. All right, maybe they're lost, maybe I'm wrong, maybe this is a futile project, but it's a project that comes from my heart. I'll keep doing it. I'm gonna keep, we're gonna be putting out podcasts, talking about everything. We're gonna talk about everything, every book, all right? And I want you to tell me what you wanna talk about as well. We'll talk about it. You wanna get on the podcast yourself? Come on, we'll have a chat. We'll chat about anything. Shakespeare, Stevenson, Dickinson, anyone you wanna talk about, we'll chat. All right, as long as it's from the heart. Podcasts, videos, books, lectures. I'm putting together a whole lecture series on Introduction to Shakespeare. Each lecture is a different play. 
and we're going to go through in a reading order that I think is the best reading order. And you're going to, get, and you're going to read all of Shakespeare, because Shakespeare's amazing. The universities don't want you to read Shakespeare. But he's amazing, you have to read him. And we're going to read him together, we're going to do King Lear and Much Ado About Nothing, and we're going to do lectures that are actually fun, where you go, whoa, that's a lecture? That's not a lecture? Huh. Anyway, that's why I'm doing hardcore literature. As Ernest Becker said, it's a drop in the confusion. It's my attempt to put something a little bit nice in the world. And I hope people see it, I hope people get involved, I hope if people see me reading a poem, they also decide to read a poem. Or if they see me analysing a poem, they also decide to jump on and we just open up this big conversation and we all read together and we all have a good time and we all make the world a nice, loving place through literature. That's why I'm starting Hardcore Literature. Anyway, hope you get involved. Tell me what you think. Hope you're on board. We're going to have a good time. Thanks for watching and watch this space.